Hi. I am Kirk Lombard, as you may have gathered. And uh, I am known in uh, San Francisco, where I live, as the singing fisherman. I'm often heard while I'm sitting on my kayak. I have one of the few commercially registered fishing kayaks in the state of California. And I'm often heard singing while I'm fishing. I'm a small fish fisherman. I do uh, some small scale commercial fishing for um, members of the smelt family. And I do both night smelt and surf smelt fishing. And I'm trying to get an artisanal permit. I want the fish and game department to allow me to use small scale fishing nets to catch herring next season. Um, here, here's a question. Um, can you guys tell me which, which one of those is the herring? Now, if you think the one on the top is the herring, just raise your hand. And if you think the one on the bottom is the herring, raise your hand. So most of us are thinking that the one on the bottom is the herring. And that's great, because you're all wrong. <laughs> um, but what, what I want, and it'll just make me look smarter. But uh, the, reason, the reason I want to I wanna point this out is that um, um, I think of it as the gospel of small fishes. And it's related to this whole issue of sustainability that everybody is so concerned with right now. That fish on the bottom, by the way, is the fish that built the cathedral of small fishes that is Monterey, California. That is the Pacific sardine. The one without the spots is the Pacific herring, which I do a lot of fishing for recreationally. And hopefully next year I'll have that artisanal permit. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about, about why we should be, as it says there, why you might want to consider eating these fishes. Um, I have a business in San Francisco called Sea Forager Tours. And what I do, as you can see here, is I take people on coastal walking tours all over what many people think of as a ruined, urban, post-apocalyptic shoreline. <laughs> and I show them how vibrant and how alive it is and how much stuff there really is living along these sort of areas that look forlorn and destroyed, you know, like old pier piling sticking up and, and a, a sewer running, a sewer runs through it. That's the name of the movie they're gonna make about what I do. <laughs> what I love to instill in people is this idea that uh, everybody thinks that nature has to be a, um, a Sierra Club calendar, right, with, uh, with big beautiful mountains and all this. But, but the nature that lives in these urban areas is so rugged and has had to survive so much that, um, that it's, I think, a really cool thing to honor it. And if you can follow certain principles, like, for instance, the eating of small fishes, as opposed to the big apex predators at the top of the food chain, which are full of all kinds of toxins because they are eating all the smaller fishes, if you can feed lower on the food chain, you can actually subsist on a lot of things that, that live in our urban estuary. Um, here's some pictures of my handsome customers. Here's a, me torturing a poor Dungeness crab. So you see, I, I'm taking a lot of people out. And it's really interesting to me that this question that people are constantly asking me on the tour. You know, I started this because of my love of fishing. But the question that everybody wants to know is how do I know that this piece of fish I'm eating is sustainable? OK, you can have the Monterey guide. What if the fish you want to eat isn't on that guide? Right? What if you're in, a, in a, a seafood market in San Francisco and there's 15 different species? Everybody goes through this. Everybody who eats seafood I know goes through this. You know, what about this shrimp? It comes from a shrimp farm. How do I know the, the, the Ecuadorian shrimp farms? Are they sustainable? I don't know. I, what about this thing? It's called a strawberry grouper. Now, I'm a, I'm a fish head, okay? I know every frickin' fish I, that's in every market. I can tell you the whole history behind all of them. I never saw a strawberry grouper in my life until yesterday. But, but, but I have a solution to this issue. Don't buy the strawberry grouper if you don't know where it came from. That's one thing. But there are three things that you can do if you are a seafood lover. And here we are in Monterey, California. I'm just loving the fact that I can talk about this here. There are three things that you can do if you live in this area of the world, if you live on the Pacific Coast, and in many other areas as well that have an ocean shoreline. There are three things you can do. Number one, feed lower on the food chain. Why is that? Because a sardine and an anchovy are designed by nature to withstand heavy predation. I can bet you there's not a whole lot of anchovies that die of old age. 
They're born. They're out in the water, part of the planktonic cloud. They're swimming around. Their whole life is about trying to escape getting eaten, and eventually they're going <laughs> to. The strange thing about this is that in America, and I'm not, I'm not just trying to beat up. I love my country. I'm not trying to beat it up in this way. But in America, these small fishes have not really been embraced in, in the same ways that they've been embraced in, in certain Asian cultures and God knows in, in, um, in North European cultures, my, my wife, the fish wife, who will be joining me out here in a little while, she doesn't mind being called a fish wife, by the way. Um, but it's true. <laughs> um, but uh, my wife is from Denmark, and, and uh, having gone to Copenhagen a few times now, I mean, that's like, uh, they eat more herring than bread there. And, uh, and I just, I got into the whole, yeah, right. Um, and it's all, it's all cool, you know, if you're, I'm not trying to say that you can harvest these species limitlessly, and um, you can catch enough for you. And then if, you, if you're actually going out and catching them yourself, um, you know about the bycatch. You know if the fisherman was following the rules. You know uh, if you destroyed habitat. Whereas if you're getting them from that, well, if you're getting them from that, you're buying them as a pill. Because, you know, these guys are going out, they're catching billions of pounds of these small fishes. It is sustainable for us to feed ourselves directly on this resource. It is not sustainable to take them and turn them into pellets to feed tuna in fish farms in Australia or to feed salmon in salmon pens. That is not sustainable. What is sustainable is if we learn to eat these fish ourselves. And the first thing that everybody asks me on my tour when I discuss this is they're like, well, but what about all the bones? These are small fish. What about all the... How do I know how to... So if I had a fish with me right now, I could... Sh oh, wait a minute. I'm going to put this down. I just happened to be walking around today. <laughs> and I, I, I got a fish. <laughs> and I got, a, I got a clock here too, man. I feel like I got to put up the three-pointer here because I got the... I got the clock going, but I got this fish, and I just want to, now, I cut its head off, scaled it, and removed the guts to, to spare you guys, <laughs> um, but, oh, this is a beauty. This was in really nice condition. Usually, usually, it's been in my back pocket. It's not great. You don't want to buy fish if they've been in somebody's <laughs> back pocket. <laughs> what I want to show you is that um, a lot of people are freaked out by bones. Now, the Americans have a problem with the bones and small fish. I eat the small bones, but uh, some people can't just can't hang with the eating of bones in a fish. Well, if you can't, what you do is you, you take your sardine or your, this will work with smelt, this will work with anything, any small fish. You take it, you bring it home, you put it in the refrigerator. Next morning, having gutted and headed it, so you pull the guts out, put, take the head out. You simply take your fingers and you press in like this, like I'm doing right now. I can't believe I'm doing this on stage here. <laughs> you press in on the spine. You're almost going to feel while you're doing this, I don't know if the camera can get this, but you almost feel while you're doing this like you're kind of messing up the meat. You're not, because I'm being very gentle. I'm gently coaxing. If I had a pan pipe, I could use the pan pipe to gently coax. <laughs> and then what I do is I simply grab the spine. Yeah. Okay. Now you got something you can work with. I mean, you can fry that puppy. You can, it's all splayed out like this, so you can, it makes a real good smoker when you do this. And, you know, if you're catching these in small amounts, it's, it's not that much work to do this. When you go down to the bay, and you, 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 so many people think the bay is this polluted, destroyed estuary. And you go down to the bay and uh, in the winter when the herring run, and you walk down to areas that you just always thought of as just the most polluted areas, you know, like, some of the areas around Hunters Point, Candlestick Park, Third Street, Drawbridge. There's a, I don't know if I can say this on the camera, but there's a creek there that they call Shh Creek. <laughs> All of these beautiful, like awful industrial areas. And you go down there in the height of herring season and you pull up your car and the, the, the sun is coming up over Oakland and you look out across this wasteland, this vista of of post-apocalyptic urban nightmare. 
And what do you see? You see not, not 1,000, not 2,000. You see 45,000 seagulls. You see an Iceland gull, if you're into seagulls like I am. You see western greens. You see cormorants swimming in and out. You see sea lions. The bay, for a brief moment during a herring spawn, and, and this is how it is with all these small fish, because these small fish are so important, so vital to the food chain, and, we, and yet we ignore them. But anyway, you look out, and for a moment, this is what I sometimes do. I squint my eyes like this, like this right now, because the light is shining on me. I can't see so well. So you squint your eyes just a little bit. You look out at that, and you get this brief image of what it must have looked like in 1773, two years before the San Carlos came through the Golden Gate Bridge. You, you can see it, you can feel it. And um, I don't know how better to illustrate that sort of passion that I have that I, I hope is infectious and I hope people will go out and look for these small fishes, look for these big spawns, even in urban areas that you think of as destroyed. I don't know how to better illustrate the insp inspiration that I feel than by having my, um, my wife come up here with the accordion and we're gonna sing a song. <laughs> so, um, Oh, my little boy. Okay, so we're going to try to do this song. Usually, I, he likes my loud singing voice, so. Um, go ahead. Oh, it was a fine and a pleasant day. Out of Yarmouth Harbor I was faring. As a cabin boy on a sailing lugger, we were following the shoals of herring. Oh, we fished the swars and the broken bank. I was cook and I'd a quarter sharing. And I'd often sleep standing on me feet. We were following the shoals of herring. Now you're up on deck. You're a fisherman. You can curse and strike a manly bearing. Take a turn on watch with the other fellas. You were following the shoals of herring. On the stormy seas and the living gales, to ease your early bread, your daring. From the canny shields to the Faroe Islands, we were following the shoals of herring. <laughs> we were following those shoals of herring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.